This is the Hidden Killers podcast with Tony Bruschi. Featuring author, psychologist, and daily contributor, Siobhan Scott. It all began with Osage County Sheriff Eddie Vierden doing a little investigating, trying to find possible links between Raider and a woman who disappeared in the 1970s, Cynthia Kinney, a 16-year-old, when he learned that Raider had included the phrase bad laundry day in his writings. He, Raider had attempted to write a book years ago. It's now in evidence in Wichita. But there's a lot of seemingly breadcrumbs in these writings to crimes that may have occurred prior to the ones that he has admitted to, which is now where they are at. Let's talk about this. This is one he has never admitted to. He still has not claimed any sort of accountability, even though the investigation is going into this. What's your take on this? Raider seemed to be one who was very open to talking about the crimes that he had committed. Why not this one if it is him? Well, and Raider is also a game player. You yeah. know, he was the one writing notes to the police and, you know, enjoying the little cat and mouse thing he had going. And so it would not surprise me if he doesn't still do that to some degree. <laughs> and it would not surprise me that there were many more murders than the ones that he has owned up to. And, you know, you never know when a person like this is telling the truth. You just don't know. So I think it's a horrifying real possibility that he was involved in this other disappearance. Is this part of his game? Because it's it gets even deeperly, more more deeply disturbing with Sheriff Eddie Vierden, who visited BTK in prison, and he wanted to question him about this kidnapping. And before he even brought up anything about the specific case he was looking at, which involved Cynthia Kinney, the 16-year-old cheerleader, disappearing from her parents' laundromat uh, before being found murdered, bind, tortured, and killed. He talked about a fantasy that he had, explaining to the investigator that he would watch a laundromat in his fantasy till there was a woman there that was alone. Then he'd go in with a ruse and get her to his vehicle. and Then he'd have her and nobody would ever see or hear anything again. This is the fantasy mm -hmm. he's describing prior mm -hmm. to him, Raider, even knowing that this is what they are looking into. Is that Raider knowing that maybe they're finally figuring out one of my hidden stories? So what if I told him this little fantasy tale I have and watch them try and connect the dots? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would not surprise me at all. That's just the kind of little mind games, you know, when we think about what do serial killers, how do they spend their time in prison, right? They've got a lot of years in prison, and particularly in his case. And this is the kind of thing that's entertainment for them, mm -hmm. thinking up little games like that. When they, and he's a 78 year old man, his daughter, Carrie, has said that he's getting old, he's a shell of what he used to be. He's frail, probably some senile things going on in that. How does that affect, especially the aging process and just deteriorating over time? How does, how do we see that affect serial killers and people that have these sort of minds in terms of revealing any of their past crimes? Does that ever happen or do some of those things just, you know, slowly fade away with them never to be heard of again? You know, that is something I don't believe I have ever seen any research on. Dementia in the serial killer. Wouldn't that be an interesting study? Yeah. Do they age differently? Do they disclose more? We certainly have not seen that happening yet. I'm just thinking about the Golden State Killer, who's also up there in age and was just recently incarcerated. And he does not seem to be disclosing anything. Yeah. So this would be really an interesting thing to research if we had enough of them who lived long enough in a way that we could go in and, you know, do some evaluations. I, I don't have that information, yeah. but it's a really good question. It's a fascinating thing, fascinating thing to think about and probably also to observe as Raider ages. And as I'm sure, probably to his death and past his death. We will be inquiring about cases that may be connected to him. How often is it that someone like this who had a track record that we know of, you know, at least 10 murders, all pretty much the same thing, bind, torture, kill. There was never a sexual assault. He did admit that, you know, he got sexually aroused by this and mm -hmm. did 
pleasure himself at the scene of the crimes, but he never raped anyone. Mm -hmm. Out of character, and how likely is it that Radar would be connected to, or, or would be the culprit in another one that he is connected to at this moment in time, or suspected of 22-year-old Shauna Beth Garber, whose body was discovered in 1990. Autopsy revealed that she had been raped, strangled, and restrained with bindings about two months before her body was found in McDonald County, Missouri. So some of the signs of BTK, the bind, the torturing, the raping, not part of his M.O., is that likely Dennis Rader murder or... You know, is it not? Did he decide to change something up, if you will, as horrible as that exactly, is? Exactly. Exactly. You know? I would never say never. Yeah. You know, and we just don't have enough information. It certainly is a could be because mm -hmm. sometimes there's this really rigid MO that is followed basically to the letter every time. But other times it varies. You know, weapons may vary. The Golden State Killer used guns. Sometimes he bludgeoned people. Sometimes he murdered them. Sometimes he didn't. You know, so I don't think we can ever say it always has to be a certain way. It can certainly change depending on other circumstances. When we talk about the trophies or items that sometimes these people will bring back with them for sexual pleasure, usually have them somewhat readily available in secret places to themselves. What about this with Raider? What they were just dug up last week in his Park City former property, deep in the ground, these would not have been readily available souvenirs for him to go and grab and use in his sadistic ways. These were deep underground. They would have been deep underground when the house and the shed were there. There would have been a shed over them, technically. So they're more like time capsules, if you will, that he was storing down. What is that? If those are things he's not able to readily dig up and use for his own mm -hmm. sadistic fantasies, why the time capsules? I think there's this weird phenomenon of after a murder, the perpetrator often has this sense of, I have kept a part of the victim's soul with me. I We've bonded forever. And it's almost like here's a tangible object that represents this person to me and I've got it. And so even if it's not something that they take out and use, which most of them do for masturbation, it's that knowledge that I've got some part of you still with me. Creepy, supernatural yeah. and creepy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wow. really creepy. It is creepy. And there's this whole weird you know, internal dynamic about being bonded together forever into eternity with your victims. And it's very strange, but it's not uncommon. You're locked into the Hidden Killers podcast. Want more? Start binging on all of our true crime podcasts right now through Apple Podcasts and get an ad-free experience when you sign up to be a True Crime Today Premium Plus member exclusively on Apple Podcasts. More of the Hidden Killers podcast dropping soon. Press subscribe now.